As the Carolinas grapple with Florence's destructive forces, President Trump sparked a new political storm after questioning the number of Americans killed in the aftermath of Puerto Rico's storm last year. And the general election for control of the House and Senate has officially begun. A perfect moment for the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. Uh, Mark, um, I'm going to start with uh, the Paul Manafort plea. Uh, he'd said for months uh, that he wasn't going to do this, uh, but now he has. He's pled guilty, and he's cooperating with Robert Mueller. We, there's clearly so much we don't know, but uh, what does this mean for the president, potentially? It means bad news. Uh, it's the Paul Manafort is the person closest to the president who was in the campaign, who was uh, involved in the meeting at Trump Towers with the Russians, uh, who was involved uh, intimately in the convention preparations, the changing the platform of the uh, uh, you know, position on Ukraine. Uh, so it, it, there's, a, there's a lot. And, and plus, he was the, he was the conduit, uh, to the degree there was one in the Trump campaign, to the traditional Republican Party. So Paul, Paul Manafort is potentially a real problem. David. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's striking to me how late in the process it is that this plea deal came. Maybe Manafort was holding out, but the fact that uh, the Mueller decided to accept and cut the plea suggests there's something there, uh, either about Trump, about a member of Trump's family, about somebody else. Uh, it suggests that Mueller is proceeding slowly, and, but, but very uh, remorselessly. Uh, and so it might not even be about Russia. It's been interesting. A lot of the indictments that have so far come down have not been about Russia. They've been about other things, and there could be some other, um, some other law-breaking, potential law-breaking somewhere in Trump's past. Yeah, we will certainly watch and, watch and wait. In the meantime, as I mentioned, um, Mark, this is the week in which we're waiting for this hurricane to hit the east, southern, uh, southeastern coast of the U.S. President Trump uh, surprised everyone with a tweet uh, the other morning questioning the number of people who died in the aftermath of, uh, of Hurricane Maria that, that hit uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, the, the outside experts, uh, completely non-political, had uh, come to the conclusion, several of them, it was around 3,000. The president said that's not so. Um, it's not just Democrats, but Republicans in the state of Florida and elsewhere have come back and said uh, the president's wrong. Um, what has he stepped into here? He stepped into Judy and exposed, exposed himself as somebody uh, whose ego is so out of check, uh, whose narcissistic impulses are, are so total that he could equate a, a personal tragedy of, of enormous dimensions of some 3,000, now some estimates were as high as 4,000 plus deaths in Puerto Rico to being a political conspiracy against him by the part of his political enemies. Uh, as far as the Republicans in Florida, Rick Scott, the governor, not surprisingly, uh, spoke out, said, it's not true. Uh, he has been to Puerto Rico himself seven times. He's made a big effort politically and, and governmentally to welcome the Puerto Ricans, the diaspora who've been moved to to Florida as a result of that storm, who immediately become voters in that state. But what probably most telling was Ron DeSantis, the Republican nominee for governor, the mini-me uh, of this campaign, the Donald Trump clone, uh, self-styled, self-admitted, uh, saying that he uh, did not agree with the president on this, which is, uh, I don't know what it's comparable to, uh, it, breaking with the king. Uh, and uh, so it, 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 I would say that uh, Trump has, has really, in this case, isolated himself and exposed himself. Any positive calculus for the president? Here, <laughs> no, David? hard to think of that one. Uh, it almost makes you nostalgic. Remember when he was bragging about his crowd size at the inaugural? Mm -hmm. That at least that was a lie, but at least it was a harmless lie. That's right. Uh, this is a lie where you render three, you know, nearly three thousand Americans invisible, uh, that you don't acknowledge right. their existence uh, and you don't even see them. And so it's intentionally telling the the families of the people who died and those who died and anybody who cares about their fellow citizens that you can write them out of the history books because their deaths make Donald Trump look bad. Just and one, so it's almost oh, pathological. Go ahead. Pardon, pardon me. I, I agree. Just one other thing, Judy. The politics of disasters, natural disasters in this country, are very real. Uh, you know, to go back to, to Superstorm Sandy on the eve of the 2012 election, when Barack Obama, the president, went to New Jersey and Republican Governor Rick Chris Christie, who was a big supporter of Mitt Romney, thanked him publicly for the 
concern and the compassion that he, he and his administration had showed the people of New Jersey suffering. And on the other side, it was George W. Bush's decline as a president in popular support uh, really was accelerated by Hurricane Katrina, his apparent indifference, his endorsement of Michael Brown, heck of a job, Brownie, as FEMA just absolutely failed. And I just say this about political, about natural disasters, there's no politics involved among people. Whether it's red states or blue states, liberals or conservatives, they look to the federal government, uh, regardless of philosophy, for help. Uh, for effective, efficient, responsive help. Um, and uh, Donald Trump, when he went to Texas after the great storm last year, first thing he said was, what a crowd, what a turnout. Yeah. Uh, again, making it about Hurricane Donald Oregon. Trump. Yeah. Yeah. And, and David, this comes as uh, there are some polls now, and in fact, a, a number of polls over the last few weeks that are showing some slippage in the president's approval rating. You know, we're wary of bringing up polls because we know they're, we're reminded they're just snapshots. But are we seeing something here? We are now officially past Labor Day. We are into the general election right. season. They're snapshots, but it's a moment, and we're only two months away from an election. And the basic trend had been Donald Trump had been sitting around 43 for the longest of times, an incredibly stable poll. He, there was this scandal, that scandal, whatever. Nothing moved him. And then in the last two weeks, suddenly he drops to 37, 38. So, and that's a significant chunk. It sounds like whatever, five, six, seven, or eight points. But it, especially two months before an election, that's the difference between your party doing badly in the midterms and your party getting wiped out in the midterms. And so the question is, what's happened? Why all of a sudden is it going mm -hmm. down? And there's probably no one answer, maybe a little, the comparison with John McCain. I mostly think it's seasonal, that people came, you know, they weren't paying attention, it was summertime. And they come back and they start paying attention and they're, they're more annoyed with the guy than they were. But the drop is among, of course, it's among independents and Republicans. Uh, and so it's, it's very, would be very alarming news for all Republicans, should be very alarming news. And Mark, we've been saying uh, the numbers look good for Democrats in the House of Representatives, but now there's even, a glimmer of a sign that there may be good news in the Senate. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell was quoted this week as saying, we've got a, the equivalent of a knife fight in an alley in about, what, seven or eight different Senate races around the country. No, you're right. I just, I just add quickly, Judy, there. I think there are two factors that contribute to Trump's uh, trouble. First, I think the McCain funeral and its attendant attention uh, was just a reminder of a hero of military service and Donald Trump's total uh, tone deafness during that entire week. I, I think the contrast is in people's minds. Anybody who is a veteran, knows a veteran, had a veteran in the family, respected military service, I, I think he had to look at it and, and just be recoil from his performance. The second thing is, I think, quite frankly, his tweet tweeting is is wearing thin. I, I think it's lost its freshness. I mean, when you tweet tw two dozen times about the national anthem and the NFL, he did have an ability almost to drive the political narrative. And I think that's, I, I think that's failed him. As far as the Democrats in the Senate, it's unthinkable that they would uh, even be competitive. I mean, they have 10 seats up in states that Donald Trump, Democrats running for re-election, Donald Trump carried five in which he won by landslides, West Virginia, right. Indiana, Missouri, Montana, and North Dakota. Um, and yet, uh, they're, they're competitive and encouraging numbers for Democrats. Democrats. Um, and all I'm reminded of is Texas. If Texas is in play, I mean, Bill Cohen, the former Secretary of Defense, Senator from Maine, who never lost an election in Maine, uh, uh, said once, before they vote for you, they have to like you. And if that's the case, if they, before they vote you, they have to like you, Ted Cruz is in trouble in Texas, and Beto O'Rourke is a good bet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> what, what do these congressional races look like? You know, I, you know, we were now at the end of the primaries, and so I think we've learned some things. Um, Donald Trump owns the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. In just about every place you looked, the person who was most pro-Trump won, and anybody who crossed him, out. And so the conservative movement is whatever it was, it's a Trump party right now. The second thing we learned is that the Democrats have not swung super far left. Yeah. Uh, the, if you look at who was backed by various groups, the DCCC, which is the Democratic official establishment, like 97% of their candidates won. Right. The New Democrats, they had like 87%. That's the moderate group. And then the, there are a bunch of more left-wing groups. They had like 30-odd, 37% of their candidates. They got a lot of headlines. but Yeah, so they had some a few races that were shocking where mm -hmm. the left-wing candidate really right. won. But in general, the party did not swing. And then the final thing is turnout. The Democratic turnout doubled it's... over previous. Um, primary. So those are pretty much the takeaways that I see. 
I think David's right. I think the, the, the intensity and the interest and the enthusiasm on the Democratic side right now, and by every measurement, just in 2010 and 2014, they were on the Republican side. And to me, the, in the midterm, that's the greatest measurement of what's going to happen, where the enthusiasm, where the intensity, where the interest in the campaign is. And it's higher among Democrats by an increasing margin than it is among Republicans. Part of the problem is that Donald Trump has said to his people, polls don't matter. Uh, don't don't believe what you read. And now he's going to come back and say, "Well, wait a minute. I, mm -hmm. You know, the polls aren't great. So please get enthusiastic and get in, get involved." Well, we'll see where they are next week. But the last thing I want to ask you both about, just quickly, about a minute, less than a minute left, David, is is there what we just heard Lisa and Yamish reporting on uh, the the this allegation against Brett Kavanaugh, something that happened allegedly in high school. Where do you see this going, or do you see it mattering? Well, we're, given what we know right now, if he did it. He would be disqualified, and he should be disqualified. But right now, an anonymous, um, very abstract, very vague, uh, with no police record, there was no police evidence. I don't think that um, stops his nomination. It's it's something that he everyone denies, uh, and if there's no evidence, I don't think uh, it's going to hurt him. Yeah, I, I I don't know, but in in this atmosphere, when you've just had a week where the the president of CBS News and the, the producer of its most popular show uh, fell to, to charges. Um, I mean, the charges are taken more seriously than they have in the past, but I mean, this is a far reach back and it's totally out of character from anything else we've ever learned about Brett Kavanaugh. A very different time from Clarence Thomas. Very different. Yes, absolutely. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you.